Without any further ado, would you please welcome Mr. Andy Gavin. Thank you, Pastor. That's pretty sure. Well, good morning. After now, uh, I have some enemies probably because he said I was a Packer fan. But uh, I, I'll leave it at that. You guys, you have a, you have a good team, okay? <laughs> I like Drew Brees, okay? That's about it, but I like Drew Brees. <laughs> But uh, excited to be here is a privilege and an honor uh, to be before you this morning, some I don't take lightly, but uh, just excited about this weekend. We had an opportunity, uh, especially yesterday, uh, didn't know much about the oldest fishing tournament in the United States of America until yesterday, quite the experience, to say the least. Uh, actually, what was probably even a greater experience, or a crazier experience, I should say, is a uh, Flying in on, on Friday night, my, my plane got delayed in Atlanta, um, which uh, seemed to always have to go through Atlanta for, for connecting flights on Delta, but uh, didn't get in until real late, and then driving from New Orleans uh, into uh, Grand Isle, and, and, and the, I guess it wasn't really a parade, but everybody lined in the streets. I thought they were so excited about the strength team coming to town, <laughs> and, and then, you know, kind of saw what was going on and realized it probably had nothing to do with us. But, uh, but it was interesting. It was interesting to say the least. Saw, saw a very, very large uh, blue marlin that was caught yesterday right when we were there. So a uh, very cool experience. And uh, what th- what, one thing that's so great about is down here, uh, fishing is, is such a part of your culture. And, and it's so easy then to take that right into being fishers of men like Jesus has called us to be. And, uh, and so tonight you have an opportunity, uh, if you ha- weren't planning on coming, I want to encourage you to be there tonight, it's just the, the one night that we have at the high school, and uh, you may say, hey, you know what, I, I'm not really into, uh, you know, breaking bricks and, and doing those kind of things, that, that's cool, because I'm not really into it either, I, <laughs> if, if I didn't have to do those things, I, I, I'd, I'd be happy not to, uh, but well, one of my partners is here, Dr. Smiley Elmore, uh, he's actually preaching in Grand Isle this morning, and so we, we, we're, we're a lot different. We're about the same height, but uh, you know, I, I'm a strong man competitor. I just like to lift up heavy things and put them down. That's what I like to do. Smiley Elmore is a professional, all-natural bodybuilder. He is actually one of the top bodybuilders in the world today. Uh, this guy's muscles have muscles. Um, so you, you want to come out just, just to see that. Just an incredible man of God. Uh, has a doctorate in uh, children's uh, education and, uh, or children's ministry and, and just an awesome man of God. So I want to encourage you tonight to come tonight, but bring some lost people. Bring some people that you know, maybe you've been praying for, maybe you've been working on them for a while. Uh, just tell them to come out and say, hey, we want to come see these crazy guys do some things. I think you'll enjoy it. And, and we're going to share testimonies. We're going to preach the gospel, and we're going to believe uh, the Holy Spirit of God to do what only He can do, and that's draw people to salvation. And so uh, we're hoping you'd, you'd love to be a part of that. And so this morning, uh, my main text is going to be from John chapter 4. Uh, this may be a, a, a very familiar scripture to most people. It's a, an interaction that Jesus had, an encounter that he had with the Samaritan woman at the well. And, uh, and so for me, myself, growing up in church, my earliest memories of life are in church. Um, it was a story that I'd heard many times growing up, but, but didn't really study it too deeply until the last few years and really get a grasp on it. And so uh, I'm an evangelist. That's what I do. I'm ordained uh, minister through my home church in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, travel probably about 35 weeks out of the year, so do a lot of traveling with the string team and, and on my own just uh, trying to get out and share the gospel with people. And so a lot of times people will say, well, uh, you know, that, that's good. That's what God has called you to do. You're an evangelist. Uh, you're supposed to do that. Or our pastor, you know, he's supposed to go and visit people and share the gospel. You know, that, that, that's what pastors do. That, that, that's their job. But, but I got to let you know that, that it's every one of our jobs as a Christian. If you call yourself a born-again believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, it is your duty to share the gospel. And you say, well, wait a minute, where, where do you get that from? Well, uh, Matthew 28. It, it, it's not a suggestion. It's, it's not something that that Jesus said, hey, if you feel inclined to do so, if you feel like you're a good talker, uh, if you, you feel up to it, go and share the gospel. No, he says, go therefore and preach the gospel. That is a commandment. Uh, it's not a suggestion. And so uh, one thing I've seen over eight years of traveling all over the United States and all over the world, uh, churches a lot of times, we have a tough time trying to put that plan into action. And, uh, and so 
uh, looking for different strategies, looking for different ways to try to share the gospel, to be an evangelist, and, and that's what John chapter 4 is going to help us with, uh, I believe, today. And so the idea from all of this came, uh, my wife and I, because I travel so much, uh, we like to have, you know, little date nights and things, and uh, we have a, a 13, or excuse me, a 15-month-old son at home, and now we have another one on the way, and so we don't necessarily get to go out that much. A lot of times it's staying in, and that's why we say thank God for DVR, because we can record things, uh, but one of the shows we really like to watch is, is a show called Celebrity Apprentice. Uh, you guys probably have seen some of, of course, Donald Trump runs the whole thing, and what he does is they have different, you know, competitions in the business world to raise money for, for different uh, nonprofit organizations. And so uh, this last season that they had was like an all-star version. And there was a man on there who, who I really, really just, uh, I started to admire. I really liked the way that he presented himself, how nice of a guy he was. His, his name is Penn Gillette. He's a magician from, from Las Vegas, uh, part of Penn and Teller. Some of you may know some history behind him. Uh, I didn't know a whole lot of history behind him, but I just watched him in action. Uh, just a super nice guy, always treated people with respect and, and, and really spoke highly of even the people that he was competing against. And so I thought, man, maybe, just maybe, uh, you know, the fruit of this guy seems like some good fruit. Maybe this guy's a believer. I, I need to check into this and look into it. Only to find out that uh, he is one of the most outspoken atheists that we have in the world today. In fact, he's gone to lengths of making videos on YouTube to try to trash the Bible, the Word of God, uh, to counter Christianity. And it kind of took me by surprise. Um, you know, I, just watching this guy, so many people I've seen, we think that, hey, if we just live a life, if we just do the best that we can, people are going to see our good works, you know, and, and then that's going to draw people to, to Christ. And yes, the Bible talks about, uh, let your light shine before men that they see your good works and they will glorify your Father in heaven. But when it comes to evangelism, the Bible doesn't talk about just living a good life and that's going to be enough. It tells us that we have to open our mouths. We have to share the gospel. And so I stumbled across a video that he made, and it was an encounter that he had with a Christian man. After one of his uh, programs, I guess if you will, one, one of his uh, magic programs, they, they have a meet and greet session, and there was a guy that came up to him uh, and handed him a Gideon Bible. And he had just a, a little message it, written in front and, and a few phone numbers, I guess, that if he was interested in calling him. But he just was very complimentary of the guy. And, and um, so Penn is, is, is doing this little video blog talking about this situation. And, and he goes so far as to say he knows for a fact there's no God. And you, you, you kind of bite your tongue and continue to watch the video. But this is what hit me. This is what struck me. He said uh, that he has no respect for anyone, especially a Christian who believes that, or if you believe that there is a real hell and people who don't have Jesus as their Lord and Savior are going to go there one day, then he said this, and, 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 and this just struck me. He said, how much then do you have to hate me not to tell me that there's a way that I can avoid this place called hell? And, and it was like a punch in the gut. <laughs> I was like, wow, here's a guy that, that very blatantly, very outspoken about his uh, disliking for any type of God, and here he's, he's giving me inside information, <laughs> kind of giving me the game plan for that side of the team. How much do you have to hate me? And I thought, man, you know what, a lot of us as, as believers, we never look at it that way. But really, when it's all said and done, if we have the answer, this world is hurting. They need something. We look to politics, we look to all these other things, they always fail. Listen, we already know the answer, the thing that never fails, and it's found in Jesus Christ. And so if as a body of Christ, if we can rise up, if we can be soul winners, then we can turn this thing around for the sake of the kingdom of God. And so as I said, John chapter 4 is the main text today that I want to speak from, and, and this is an encounter that Jesus Christ himself had uh, with a woman at the well, and it, and it deals with evangelism. So if we're going to use anybody in Scripture, a lot of great people that we can model our lives after, but if there's one person, obviously, that you want to model yourself after more than anybody, that would be Jesus himself. And so I want us to look at this today and see uh, Jesus' approach to evangelism. I'll give you four keys, four things that, that I've pulled from this Scripture that I believe are going to help us when it comes to being soul winners, when it comes to being evangelists. So uh, John chapter 4, starting in verse 1, it says, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, 
Although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Now before I go any further, I want to draw out two things that, that we can gloss over uh, as a very common thing. The first few times that I really seriously studied this and read through, I kind of missed this, but it's very important when it comes to the whole rest of this story. First of all, in verse 4, it says, Jesus had to pass through Samaria. And you might think, okay, that's not a big deal. But if you look at the history, if you look at the relations between the Jewish people and the Samaritans in the times of Jesus, it was like oil and water. Jews would not go through Samaria. They would take a, an extra day or two sometimes journey to purposely go completely around it so they didn't have to go through it. So, so we can't overlook the fact that it says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. So I don't, what, why did he have to go there? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us that. We could speculate and say, hey, maybe he had an appointment. He needed to get there on time. Shortest distance between two points, a straight line. I don't know. As we read further in there, I realize that I do know why. It was because he had a divine appointment with this woman at the well. and God had already set it up for him to, to meet this woman. The other thing is, is right there, the last verse that we read, verse 6, it says it's about the sixth hour. And a lot of times people don't, don't understand this. They don't know. They might think it's 6 a.m. or 6 p.m. But the sixth hour, uh, according to Jewish calendar and a Jewish tradition, was high noon. It's right in the middle of the day. So here we have the, the hottest part of the day. The sun's at its peak uh, in the desert, traveling on this road. And he runs in, uh, or he, he comes to this well, and this is where we continue in verse 7. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You were right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one now you have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know, we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So I know this is, this is kind of a long portion of scripture. But we, we see this encounter. So Jesus is traveling with the disciples. The disciples leave him. They go into town to find some food. Jesus is sitting there beside this well. And this woman walks up right in the middle of the day, the hottest part of the day, to get some water. And he asks her for water. Now again, as we look at some of this, in the times of Jesus, the culture, women did not go anywhere by themselves. Normally it was always in a group. Uh, you know, maybe a half a dozen, maybe more. It was for safety, but it was also really, uh, I guess you could say, the Facebook of the time. That was uh, when they could get all the gossip and they could talk about all the things that are going on in the community. And so it was just a way for them to, to hang out. So she is by herself. The other thing is that women, they didn't go in the middle of the day. That, that wouldn't make much sense. You guys would understand this down here with how hot it gets. In the middle of the day, if you're going to go to this well and you've got to carry these water jugs, well, you're going to go first thing in the morning before it gets too hot out. And so we can look at some things in this woman by herself, not with other women. She's, she's an outcast in society. And as Jesus then addresses the, the 
husbands, if you will, in her life, now we see that, hey, maybe this is why she's an outcast. Maybe this is why people are not around her, uh, because of maybe some of the decisions she made, some of the things that she has done. And, uh, and so we see Jesus encounter this woman and share the gospel with her. And so there's, there's four things that I really want us to get. And the first one is found in verse, or verses 7 through 9. And, and the, the first point that I really want you to, to understand is that Jesus took the initiative. He took the initiative. He initiated the conversation. He didn't remain silent. He engaged this woman. And so just as I said before, it, it, it's great. We need to be examples. We need to live our lives that honor God, that people see something different about us. But Jesus engaged her. He didn't just stand there by the well and say, well, and maybe she'll take a glance at me and she'll see that I'm living my life right and she'll want to be like me. No, he went and he took initiative and he started to talk to her. And he overcame three very big hurdles that uh, I know I myself have struggled with some of these. Some of these have prevented me from, from, from doing what I'm supposed to do, sharing the gospel. Uh, but as we look at Jesus, he overcame them. And so we should be able to overcome them uh, as well by the grace and the power of God. The first thing that he overcame was physical tiredness. These guys are traveling through the desert. Uh, you know, they're thirsty, they're hungry, he's waiting for food. And so how many of us have, have used that as an excuse? Uh, I said this in the first service. I, this happened to me personally. Uh, you know, getting home from work after working 10, maybe 12 hours, and uh, you see your neighbor out next door in the yard, and the Holy Spirit's telling you, hey, you, you need to go share with them. You need to go talk to them. And, and you sit there, and I, I, like I said, I'm not proud of this, but I've done it. I'm just being honest. Just, God, I, I just worked this long day. Uh, I, I just want to get inside. I want to wash up. I want to eat dinner. I want to, I want to relax and hang out with my family. You know, surely, you know, I'll talk to them tomorrow. I'll talk to them next week. And you miss out on that opportunity uh, when, when the Holy Spirit is poking and prodding you to share. And you do it because you say, well, God, you understand I'm tired. I've been working. I'm providing for my family. But Jesus could have used that excuse. He could have let them stop him from talking to this woman, but he didn't. He, he, he went above and beyond. The second thing that he overcame was a great social barrier in the times of Jesus. As I mentioned a little bit about you know, the women and the culture of that time, well, in public, men and women didn't conversate. Uh, not even husbands and wives normally. That was done in the privacy of your own home. In public, men and women normally did not have conversations. Uh, so this is something very out of the ordinary. You didn't see this happen. And so it would have been very easy for Jesus to say, hey, you know, socially this is unacceptable. I, you know, I can't go talk to this woman, and so somebody else will come along, or maybe some, some woman will come along and minister to her. But he didn't let that stop him. And I always, uh, always want to make this very clear. We, we need to use wisdom uh, when we're trying to, to witness somebody, when we're trying to share our faith with somebody. Use wisdom and not put yourself in sticky situations. What I mean by that is if God is telling you, uh, as a man, to witness to this woman, don't, don't not do it, but let's be smart about it. Go someplace where you're in public. Go someplace, take somebody with you so you're, you're not setting yourself up for failure. For You're not setting yourself up for the devil to try to trip you up or try to, to get you to fall. You know, likewise, same thing for women. Don't, don't just dismiss it. If God is telling you to do it, you better do it. But let's use wisdom when we do it. The other thing that he overcame was a great cultural barrier of the time. And I already talked about this, the Jews and Samaritans thing. They, they didn't get along. And Jesus easily could have said, uh, that's a Samaritan. I'll let the Samaritans deal with their... As far as Jews were concerned, Samaritans were like a half-breed. <laughs> they, they didn't want anything to do with them. But Jesus didn't let that stop them. And so how many of us uh, do the same thing? We, we look at somebody and... and, and uh, you know, I say this, you know, this person on the other side of the tracks, well, down here, maybe it's on the other side of the, of the river or over the side of the bayou. You know, you might, you might think, well, that person's a little bit different than me. I'm not going to go talk to them. Or maybe uh, their skin color is different. You know, maybe their background is different. And, and I, somebody else will surely go talk to them. I don't want to do it. Listen, we can't let that stop us from sharing the truth of the gospel, from sharing the love of Christ. And so Jesus did that. He took initiative and he overcame all those barriers. The second main point that I want us to get from this today, and this is a strategy that we can use uh, in the kingdom of God, in the body of Christ, and, and you guys are already on the right track with this just by the example of the car wash. Now that one lady, she needs to go into acting if she's not already because 
I don't know if she's still here, but I was like, man, goodness, she's, she's done that a time or two before. Um, but, uh, but what Jesus did is he went from the felt needs that she had or the physical needs that she had. She was thirsty. She was coming there to get water or she was coming there to get water to go cook or whatever she was going to do to clean. He went from that physical need that she had and he transitioned into the spiritual need. And so as the body of Christ, we can use that same strategy. We can supply people with the physical needs. What would that be? Maybe it's food. Maybe it's shelter. Maybe it's friendship, companionship. Hey, maybe it's washing their car. (laughs) That might be a need that somebody has. But we meet those needs, so then we can have an open door to be able to share the gospel with them. Listen, people aren't going to listen to you unless they know that that you really care about them. And one of the things that the church, especially in America... uh, We've been painted into a picture that that we have an agenda. And if we're going to be honest, we do have an agenda. We want to share the gospel with people. There's no doubt about it. But it can't be a fake thing. We need to genuinely care because Christ genuinely cared about people. And people will see that. They will see that you're genuine and you're trying to meet needs. You're trying to help them out. And it's going to open the door for you to be able to share the gospel. I had somebody tell me that uh, Jesus gave free food, free health care, and free education. And first I thought about this, I'm like, oh, here we go, because this is about the time with all the politics and everything going on. I was like, here we go, no more politics stuff, I don't want to be a part of it. But I really thought about this, and and it is true, Jesus did do those things. And and we are the body of Christ, right? Uh, that's, That's what the word says, we're the body of Christ. So if Jesus supplied those things, then us as the body of Christ, we need to be doing those things as well. And 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 if we did do that as the church as a whole in America our government wouldn't be in as much trouble as it is right now. Because the government is trying to do the church's job. And it's not meant for that. So if at the body of Christ, if we can supply these needs, if we can be the hands and feet, if we can take care of the widows, if we can take care of the sick like the Bible tells us to, then guess what? That burden is no longer on the government. Now we're not upset with them for spending all of our tax money in the wrong places. It solves the problem. (laughs) It takes care of it, but it takes the church to rise up to do it to take our place and do what we're supposed to do. The third point, in verses 15 to 18, and uh, if you're going to remember one thing, as an evangelist, this is the one thing that I really want you to remember, is Jesus made sin the issue in her life. He didn't soft sell the gospel. He didn't make it something that it's not. The bottom line is this. We are lost because of our sin. Bible says that, Romans chapter 3, all of sin falls short of the glory of God. We, we know that verse, we have it memorized. Romans 6, same thing, you go down the Romans road. The wages of our sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Sin and sin alone is what separates us from God. So, I've watched people who, they mean well, but they, they sell a bill of goods to somebody. What I mean by that is they tell them, hey, you know what, if you come to my church, if you come to Christ, then you know what, you're going to be healed, God's going to bless you, you're going to get a big home, you're going to get a Cadillac, you're going to get all these things, you know. And, and, and God could do that. He's God. He can do whatever He wants to do, and He chooses to do that for some people. But that's not a blanket statement across the board for everybody. That's not a promise for everybody. I don't know why some people get it and some people don't. I don't know why some people get healed and some people don't. One day, I I hope to ask the Lord that, but he's God. He can do whatever he wants. It doesn't matter what we think or what we feel about it. He is God. And so when it comes down to it, it's not about all these other things. Now, those may be some benefits that you may receive as being a child of God, part of the body of Christ. However, the only reason that we need to be born again, that we need to be saved, is because of the sin in our lives. So what happens is people paint a picture of this false gospel, and these people come running to it because they see the peripheral things. They, they want those things. They, they want the new job. They want the healing in their body. And what happens six months or eight months down the road when that doesn't happen? Who do they lose hope and faith in? God. Not, not, they're not mad at you or they're, they're not necessarily mad at the church. They, they don't believe in God because now God didn't do what you said he was going to do. But God didn't say that he was going to do that for everybody. So we sell them on something that, that's, that's a false gospel it's not true and so we have to stick with the bottom line and that sin that's what jesus did he talked about the sin issue in her life the different husbands that she had now who knows i I, you know maybe some of them passed away i I don't know what happened the the last one that says it's not even her husband it's somebody else's husband and so we definitely can take from scripture we know she's in sin over her head or at least up to her neck we know that much And, and and so that's what we need to address 
Now, here's a big key, and uh, th this I know is going to wow you guys. You're going to be like, wow, that's so profound. Um, we're not perfect. <laughs> God is perfect, so in this situation, Jesus is able to go right at the sin problem, and, and, and nothing can come back on him because he's perfect. It doesn't do it. So, so we need to be careful to, first of all, be living our lives as a representative of Christ, Sure, we're going to struggle with things. Sure, we're always fighting the flesh. We've got to crucify it daily. But we need to make sure that we're doing our best to honor God in our lives and live our lives as a follower of Christ so that people do see that. And they realize that there is something different about us. Because you can't go start telling somebody that they're in sin when you're doing the same sin that they are. They're going to be like, what is this joker? I watch him do the same thing, but he thinks he's okay because he goes to church. You know, it... it, it, it People, people aren't going to come to that. They're not going to, they're, they don't want to hear what you have to say. And so while we need to make sin an issue in, 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 in evangelism, we, we have to make sure that we're holding up our end of the bargain and we're living for Christ. We're doing our best. And so we have to make sure that sin is the issue. And the last point that I want us to really get today is found in verses 19 to 26. And, and this one for a long time was very confusing to me. I didn't really understand how this fit into this portion of Scripture. Because right at this point, verse 19, Jesus just got through talking about the sin issue in her life, talking about these different husbands that, he, that she has had. And all of a sudden now she flips the script on them. She changes the subject and she starts talking about worship. She talks, worshiping on this mountain, worship of in Jerusalem. And I'm like, okay, Lord, what, what in the world is this? This doesn't fit. It doesn't make any sense to me why this is even in Scripture right here. And then it dawned on me, I believe she was trying to change the subject. I believe it started to get a little hot. <laughs> she was feeling that conviction. She knew that he was onto something here. So, hey, let's try to change the subject. Let's start talking about worship, and uh, maybe that will distract him. Maybe he'll lose track, and, and then he'll leave me alone. But Jesus, we see another strategy here. He didn't get sidetracked. He, he, he went down the road with her. He said, okay, fine. You want to talk about worship, we'll talk about worship. Guess what? A day's coming where it doesn't matter if you're in Jerusalem or if you're on a mountain. You can worship God anywhere. And that's because now the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of us as believers. And so, so he went down that road, but then he brought it back to the cross. He brought it back to the gospel. So what we can take from that is you can know that if, if they tried to sidetrack Jesus, if they try to get him off of track, then you better believe the same thing's coming for you. You better believe that when you really commit yourself, you say, all right, I'm going to share the gospel with this person. Uh, ladies, that, that's when the kids are going to go crazy. They're going to want everything, you know. They, they, they won't leave you alone. Or the phone won't stop ringing. Or, or, or guys, maybe, maybe all of a sudden your boss wants you to work overtime. And, and all these things are coming up. The, the car, you know, breaks down. And all these different things happen because you've committed to sharing your faith. And now you're trying to get, the, the, the devil's really trying to get you sidetracked. And he's going to even use people. People in conversations are going to try to get you off track. But the good thing about it is Jesus right here, he shows us the devil's strategy. And, and the one thing that I've learned in all my years of being a Christian, the devil's strategies, they don't change. He, he, he's not really all that smart if you think about it. But at the same token, he doesn't really have to change them because they've been working for so many years. He gets people off track. And so if you can go in already knowing and expecting that you're going to get thrown off track, well, then you're going to be easy to see it, and you're going to be able to, to redirect it and take it back to the cross. And so I want to encourage you guys to do that. Those three or four things, take an initiative, supply physical needs, and move on to the spiritual needs. Make sure you make sin the issue in, your, in their lives, and don't get sidetracked. And a big key, big key, I've been trying to hammer this home with, with, uh, with my folks in my home church. I believe that, especially in America, a lot of people don't share their faith, part of because of the way we've been conditioned in this society. We live in a results-driven society. Everybody wants to see results. They want to see how much money you made or, or how many sales you had or how many this you did, this you did, how much of this you have. And so we're conditioned to think that we always have to produce, we always have to have results. And so people will try to share their faith, and, and they'll get shut down. Or maybe somebody, they'll share their faith, and that person won't get saved. And after that happens a few times, Christians start to think that they're a failure. And they think, well, I'm just not going to do it because I'm going to get turned down, or, or I'm just not doing it right, and, and so I'm a failure. But here is the key that we have to understand. We don't save anybody. 
I'll say that again. We don't save anybody. That is not our job. It's the Holy Spirit that draws people to salvation. Not us. But we do have a job, and that is to proclaim the gospel, to share the gospel. That's our part. So watch this. If you shared the gospel with somebody, and they rejected it, and they don't want anything to do with it, you're still a success. You're still a success because you did what God asked you to do. You did what you were asked to do. So don't let that be a deterrent. Don't let the enemy come and, and, and try to whisper those things in your ear and tell you that you're a failure because you're not. All you need to do is share your faith. God is the one that does the rest. And it can be as easy as this. Every single one of us, if we are a born-again believer, a child of God, a follower of Christ, you have a testimony of what God has done in your life. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, I believe it's verse 11, it says they overcame the enemy, number one, by the blood of the Lamb, that's the blood of Jesus, but number two, by the power of their testimony. And so, if you have that testimony, there's power behind it. It's great, I always encourage people to, hey, go learn the Romans road. Go learn the ABCs of salvation, the, the four spiritual laws. Whatever, whatever you want to use to share the gospel, learn those. But also know that the most powerful tool that you have in your belt is your own personal testimony. Because especially nowadays, <laughs> people can argue philosophies and religions and doctrine and all these kind of things, but you know what they cannot argue? They cannot argue a changed life. They can't argue with you about the details of your life, what God did in your life. It's your life. What are they going to tell you? Oh, that didn't really happen to you. God didn't do that. Well, I'm telling you, he did it for me. And he can do the same thing for you. And so I struggled with this for a long time. I, I, I didn't get into this in the first service. And I know we don't want to go too long because I know there's food waiting over there for people. And they'll just come and start, they'll just drag me off stage so people can get food. But, but I grew up in church. My earliest memories were being in church. I actually came, my dad was from a Catholic background, my mom was from a Lutheran background. So you want to talk about religious, you want to talk about do's and don'ts and, and, and make sure you're good enough. I, I had to endure that the first decade of my life. Now it laid a good foundation of learning stories about the Bible as a young man, but I had the cart before the horse. I thought I had to be good enough to try to achieve God's grace. And we, we understand that that's not the way it works. It's a free gift. Uh, but... The Lord saved me at nine years old. Uh, it, you know, I understood what it meant. I understood that I was a sinner. Uh, but, but it did take a few years for me to really grow and to really learn. We actually then left the church we were in. I've only been in two churches my whole life, and we're in the church that I'm in now today. Um, a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church, very much like this. I was talking to pastor. We, we come from very similar backgrounds. And, and that's where I really learned how to grow, that there was more to it than just saying a prayer and believing in God, but that you could have a relationship, that, that he talks to you, that you can learn and grow and do all these things. And so as a teenager, that really started to happen. had a great youth group um, that I really learned uh, about the Lord there, and, and, and my walk with the Lord really blossomed. And, and so when I started traveling with the string team eight years ago, I was not one of the guys that spoke. I was not even one of the guys that broke bricks or bats or anything. I was a road manager. I was a behind-the-scenes guy. Uh, I was a baseball player, so I, wasn't, I was about 50 pounds lighter than what I am right now. Um, and so I didn't do those things, but I would hear the testimonies of the guys on the team. Man, we had a guy that, that spent two years in prison, and God radically saved him. A chaplain came and witnessed to him, shared the gospel with him, he got saved. And now today, still travels all over the world sharing the gospel. You know, just some amazing testimonies that I hear. And I remember it was, it was a Saturday morning. We were going to the gym in uh, Shalote, North Carolina, just north of Myrtle Beach. And I was talking to one of my best friends at the time that was on the team, and I said, man, I'd love one day to be a strength team member, but you guys have these awesome testimonies. I mean, these are, some of these testimonies were like movie scripts, you know, I mean, just amazing, and we love, as Christians, we love to hear those, don't we? I mean, we love to hear all of these amazing testimonies, and I was like, man, you guys got all these great testimonies. Mine's like, mine's not even an after-school special, <laughs> you know, mine is, I, I grew up in church. Uh, I can stand before you today, I've never done a drug in my life, I've never smoked a thing in my life, never been drunk in my life, waited until I got married, did all these things, and so I'm like, nobody wants to hear this, this is just your normal average Joe, nobody wants to hear this story. And as I was saying that, the man that was leading the event that week, he's a pastor of a church in South Georgia, he turned, he looked at me and said, Andy, it's like, I wish I had your story. He's like, I wish I would be able to have that testimony, because he grew up in church, his dad was a pastor, and and and. 
you know, he gave his heart to the Lord at a young age as he got into high school. He got into all kinds of trouble and drugs and alcohol, you name it. Got married, almost lost his marriage, all these things. Now today he's a pastor. But he's like, I wish I wouldn't have made those decisions. And it was one of those moments in your life, I don't know if this has ever happened to anybody else, but it's where the Holy Spirit, like, slaps you in the back of the head. Am I, am I the only one that that ever happened to? Um, okay. But uh, it was one of those moments we got to the gym, and I said, guys, I'm going to be in there in a minute. I, I, I just need to have some time with the Lord. And I just sat there, and I apologized. I said, Lord, here I am complaining about the life that you gave me. Like, I want heartache. Like, I want pain. I want this baggage to carry around with me. And, and that's the great thing about it is, is you know, there's, there's testimonies of God's deliverance power that are powerful, but there's the testimony of God's keeping power. And, and to me, I, I mean, I'm a little biased because that's the testimony that he gave me, but I, I think that's the best testimony, that especially as a young person. There's a lot of young people, a lot of teenagers in here this morning. You can say, hey, you know what? Lord saved me at a young age. I committed my life to him, and, and, and I didn't waver. I went through some tough times, but you know what? I, I stayed focused on the cross. And God kept me out of a lot of those situations. And then here's, here's, here's the wonderful thing about it. Almost not a week has gone by since then. That was about six years ago. When I share my testimony in a night program where I don't have parent, a parent or parents come up to me afterwards and say, we want to thank you for your testimony. Because we didn't have that testimony, but we're trying to raise our kids that way. And we want them to understand that you don't have to go out and build a testimony. You don't have to go out and sow your wild oats to come back with this Hollywood testimony. Thank you for it. And it's just like, wow, man, Lord, you can use even me. It's just amazing. And I didn't think my testimony had any power. But I'm telling you, testimony is one of the most powerful things that you have. And I want to encourage you guys, if you haven't really thought about your testimony, real three-part, easy way. Hey, what was your life like before Christ? How did you come to know Christ? And what has he done in your life since? Very easy. You can do that. You can tell somebody that in just a few minutes. And I'm telling you, there's power in it. The Lord will use it. But I just want to encourage you guys. Man, you, you, this is a great body of Christ. I had an awesome time in, uh, in Sunday school. It just the, the Spirit of God is in this place. You can feel that. You got a great leader. So now, let's get on the same page as the body of Christ. Let's start winning souls. Let's start meeting the needs in the community so, so that little old cut-off Louisiana... <laughs> can be on the map worldwide as one of the great revivals where the Holy Spirit is just doing crazy things. And it all started because you guys just became sold out to the gospel and sold out to winning people for the sake of the gospel. It can happen. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for this morning. I just thank you for, uh, for the fact that, that you call us your sons and daughters. When we receive... You as our Lord and Savior, you, you, you call us the children of God. What, what a privilege that is. What an honor it is to be a part of your family. But we know that uh, it's our duty, it's the calling of every Christian to be a soul winner. Or so I just pray that somehow, some way, uh, through the words that came from my mouth today, that there would be some things that, that the people of this great church could hold on to, that they could... Just mull over in their heads that they could put in their hearts and they could start to work these things out and really become bold and really start to share their faith so that we can see more and more people come to the saving knowledge of you. I just pray for courage for them, Lord. I pray for a boldness that, Lord, you just stir them up so much that they just couldn't help it but to share their faith. They couldn't help but to open their mouths. And, Lord, we look forward to hearing the great testimonies of the great works that you do through this body. Bless them in Jesus' name. Amen.